Bob, thank you for coming on down. I want to uh, welcome you from Maui and also from me and also from Akaku. Thank you for being in the studio today. Uh, thank you, David. My so how did you become interested in playing music? Uh, well, um, when I was about eight years old, um, was the year that Elvis hit, 1956, so you can all can do the math. <laughs> and uh, my sister, who's two years older than me, um, um, got some records, some Elvis Presley records and some other records uh, from my father. My father uh, was a musician also, so there was always music around the house, but it was always my father's music. It was always like swing music or, or, or uh, Dixieland, and, you know, that sort of thing. So um, when he, um, he kind of was, I guess, amused by this phenomenon called Elvis Presley, and he bought my sister some of these records, and um, I got a hold of him, and I probably listened to them more than she did. Um, and um, early Elvis, there's, there's nothing like it. And, um, and, and some of the other records that he included in, in uh, this gift uh, for my sister was, uh, um, things like the Platt or some of these old doo-wop um, groups um, and, and I'm sure he didn't really know what he was buying but he he recognized a lot of the the tunes that they were recording because they were ones that he had done in his career and so he was you know interested by that so he bought them and um, as I was listening to them um, now, I, you know, I have, you know, I, not until much later did I have any kind of uh, sense of what labels were, you know, what, what was country or what was rockabilly or what was blues or anything else. Um, <clears throat> but things like the platters and that kind of tonality and that kind of harmony uh, really um, got me um, more than anything else. Um, and... Um, I would, I, you know, I would start listening to the radio then. I was living in Toledo, Ohio, which is northwest Ohio, um, which is um, near the uh, near near Detroit in terms of a market area. Uh, so I was listening to Detroit radio, mm -hmm. and this is before um, before Motown. This is like in the '50s, um, and there was a whole lot of R&B and this doo-wop sound um, going on in the radio. And I started uh, singing to it, and my mother. Uh, started um, hearing me sing and she started encouraging me and started telling me she, she really thought I had a great voice and, and, she, and she wanted to encourage me to like join the choir, right. um, which I, have, I, I did have and I have no, no interest in, you know, that was kind of where she saw me going. Um, um, and then as, uh, as I grew older, you know, and I was a teenager, um, and I was living in Connecticut at that time, um, you know, you know, the radio would come on and I would um, uh, sing along and my friends started saying, oh, gee, you know, a really good voice. So I started, uh, you know, having some confidence in that. Um, I didn't start playing any instruments until I was in college. Um, mm -hmm. I was, um, you know, maybe... Um, well, I was, in, I was in North Carolina at my grandmother's house visiting, and I found my grandfather's old harmonica. And I expressed an interest in it, and, and she said, uh, well, let's go buy you one. So she bought me this harmonica. And, uh, and I started learning how to play Oh Susanna and <laughs> Camp Town Races and that sort of stuff, you know. Right. Um, you know, and then once I did that, I kind of lost interest in it and put it away. So comes college. And um, I'm in uh, I'm in my room, and my my uh, housemate is in. Uh, we're listening to music, and uh, and and he's looking around in in, in uh, the top drawer of my dresser for rolling papers, and um, huh. and he finds my old harmonica, and he goes, Hey, what's that? We you know you I didn't know you played the harp. He called it, and I said, Oh yeah, yeah, I did blah blah blah, and told him all about that whole deal, and and he said, Have you ever heard Paul Butterfield? I said, no, never, never heard the name before. He goes, I'll be right back. And he goes into his room and he comes back with Paul Butterfield's, I think it was his first or second album. How was it that you gravitated towards blues specifically? Um, 
I, I think it was, I just, I don't, I don't really know that I gravitated toward it, you know, like it was anything that I, I did or didn't do. It was, it was, it was really kind of a, um, a, a compelling pull. I, I always, um, I always just, you know, felt it more. Um, uh, I'm a real fan of Miles Davis, who's a, like a jazz guy, but he just got blues infused through his whole sound and all of his feeling. Um, um, you know, and the tonalities of, of, of the harmonies, um, I just seemed, you know, to go there. Um, it's funny because uh, I had some conflict about that. You know, I used to, I used to occasionally um, get comments from, from people that, oh, you know, well, you know, white guys can't do, can't, you know, do the blues. They, you know, can't do it. It's got to be, you know, a black experience. And, you know, and, and um, you know, I, um, I kind of went around the tree with that. And uh, um, inevitably, I just, you know, I just kept getting called back to it. And um, it kept moving me, you know. And so I really um, kind of didn't worry about it. I noticed you brought your guitars with you. I did. I got uh, these two here. Um, these are both set up uh, in open tuning so they can be played uh, with a slide. Mm -hmm. um, this one is a, you know, is a, a Dobro. It's a type of national steel guitar, which is, uh, have, was very popular um, mm -hmm. um, with blues guys. This one is a little different. It's a, it's a, a brass guitar rather than a steel guitar, and it has a little bit different tone. This is uh, this is just a this is a, a fairly new guitar actually, but it's a it's a reproduction of a, an old Gretsch. Um, and the reason I got this one in particular, um, this one uh, over here, the the wooden one, is that um, I like to have a guitar if I travel, if I go to the mainland, and, uh -huh. and I I bought myself a little traveling guitar once and I hate it um, so I want to have a real guitar and this one was not real expensive and if it breaks it won't break my heart as opposed to other guitars that I have you know that you know would right um, so anyhow you want to hear us hear a tune yeah right on. could we hear a tune okay good <laughs> Find my baby. 
Lord gonna bury me Never run to the ocean Ocean, ocean run to the sea If I don't find my baby Child gonna bury me Bob, I really enjoyed that break. That was uh, quite an impressive display of uh, musical ability. Right, yeah. thanks. Um, now back to the interview. How long have you been on Maui? Uh, let's see, my wife and I uh, got here uh, in 1994. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, actually we, when we came here on our honeymoon, which was 20 years ago, um, you know, 1989, 89. Right. Uh, we came here on our, on our honeymoon, and uh, um, <laughs> we decided, you know, we, we did all, you know, the things that you know, like newlyweds and tourists do, you know, and, and back in those days, um, uh, uh, Cruiser Bob was the primary bicycle outfit that would take you down from the top of the crater, you know, come right. down, you know go you know, down to Paia Town from the top of the crater. <clears throat> and so we signed up for that. And, um, and so they come, they come and you know, pick you up at like three o'clock in the morning. We're on our honeymoon and they come and we were in Napili, so way out in the west side. And they come at you know, the three o'clock in the morning and pick you up and it was February. It was like, you know, freezing cold up there. You know, they trundle you up there and I had every stitch of clothes I could I had on, you know, just because it was so cold to watch. So they gave you fair warning. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, you know, to watch the sun come up, you know, because it was like, it was below freezing up there. And, uh, right. and, you know, and they put you on these bicycles and you're, you know, and the thrill is to like go down this hill on, on this ride, right? So, um, so, you know, here we are, we're up there and, and, um, and our, uh, now this is like 1989. So back where I come from, like Washington, D.C., that's where I was living. Right. Um, um, everybody's trying to look like Don Johnson, you know, everybody's dressed like, you know, Miami Vice, right? So, um, so that's kind of where things are at back there. But I, I come here and, 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 I, um, and I meet our tour guide, the guy who's going to lead us down, down the hill. 
right? And his name's Wild Bill. And he had a long ponytail and a big handlebar mustache. And I hadn't seen somebody look like him since, you know, like 1970. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, this is where they all came, you know, because <laughs> I didn't <laughs> see anybody like that around anymore. And uh, so anyway, he's, he's up there with like no shirt on, right? Right. And I don't know, you know, what he was fueling himself with, you know, a com combination of illicit chemicals he must have been imbibing to, to do this. But um, he was up there with no shirt on and he's going to take us down the hill. So they put the, the they put the, 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 tall, the, the tallest and the heaviest people in the back and I, that was me. So I'm in the back and, and, um, and, the, and the, the, you know, this poor timid little soul is in the front, you know, and she's like riding her brakes. And so, you know, to make a long story short, it was like, I hated the experience, you know, I, was, I, I couldn't like get any speed going or anything like that. And, and um, uh, you know, couldn't, um, couldn't enjoy myself. I was like riding my brakes, trying to not hit the person in front of me. Right. And so after we, were, after we were coming down for a little while, we take a break, you know, and pull over into this pullover area and take a break. And, and I went up to Wild Bill and I said, um, I said, at the risk of sounding sexist, I said, is there a, you know, is there like a, you know, like just guys can go down, you know, like a thing where just guys can go down and, you know, and, you know get some speed going, you know? And he said, no, he said, we can't do that because, uh, because the insurance, you know, won't allow us to go over 20 miles an hour, right? Then he gets this kind of far away look in his eye, right? And he says, but, he says, on full moon nights, all of the bicycle tour guides from all the different companies in the island, we all get together and we come down in the moonlight, you know, at like 60 miles an hour. I did that in Vernal, Colorado. Oh. Or Vernal, excuse me, Vernal, Utah. Yeah, yeah. It was a beautiful experience. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so, you know, so, you know, when, he, when I heard him, you know, say that, it, it, it gave me an idea for a tune, which I, I wrote, I haven't played it here, but um, it, it's a, a, a slide uh, instrumental, it's called Downhill Ride. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I either call it Downhill Ride or I call it Wild Bill's Downhill Ride, you know, and it really should be Wild Bill's Downhill Ride because uh, um, when I came back, when uh, my wife and I came back um, um, in, in 94, you know, to move here, mm -hmm. we found a, a, a white cross on uh, Baldwin Avenue and apparently he had been on a motorcycle and met up with a, a, a pineapple truck or something. And, and got himself killed and ouch um yeah and, and uh um so i you know i kind of you know it's kind of my little homage to him um but uh we we moved here from um uh, washington dc area and um she's a teacher and i'm a house painter um and so i you know, started working here and um we've we've enjoyed every minute of it here um Took a major hit on our house when we sold our house. 1994, the market was down and we had a nice little townhouse and we took a hit on it. But you know, it was like, um, life's too short to wait for the market to turn around to, you know, to be the deciding factor about, you know, how I live my days, you know? So we both agreed on that. And, and you know, she works here uh, for the, uh, the DOE and, and um, you know, I've been, you know, doing this, you know, painting business and, and um, you know, very happy with that. The funny thing is that, you know, I used to play music for a living. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it can get to be work and it can be, it get, can get to be a, a real grind. I, you know, I would, uh, I was working with a couple bands out of uh, um, Colorado. I think I mentioned that earlier, but, um, um, you know, and you're on the road for three weeks, and you're in hotels, and you know it can, it can get old, and um, you know, and I also kind of got you know fed up with the you know the band experience sort of, um, uh, you know, for all the all the times that you really are cooking and in sync. You know, there's there's just other times where personalities don't mix per particularly well. Right. Um, but. Um, uh, I know that every time I, you know, I've had a chance to, you know, to play here on Maui, and, and when I first moved here in 94, I hooked up with uh, some people, you know, that just heard me play harmonica, and, and um, you know, would sit in with them. I played at Henry's, because, you know, I'd sit in with them, you know, I played at Henry's and played at Charlie's and um, a couple other places, but, um, 
Um, I used to uh, do open mics and I do them still. I will show up at one once in a while if I can get my butt out the door. Right. Um, but um, um, I was, uh, there was a place called Moms, M-O-M-S, that was in uh, Maui Mall some years ago. It was Myers of Maui. It was, um, it was Debbie and Robert Myers that owned it. And it's, it's, uh, uh, it's in the, it was in the Maui Mall. It's in what is now, I think, a party favor store or something like that. It was a really nice little place. And they used to have um, open mics on, on Friday nights. But then they used to have, you know, music from like f uh, six or four to six or something like that um, uh, every every afternoon, you know, and you could just go in there. So um, I was I enjoyed that. I, I did that for about two years. I was playing in there just by myself, mm -hmm. you know, on Thursday nights, and then they bumped me to Friday nights, and then you know I would kind of like open up for the for the um, open mic there, and that was just a really a uh, cool little uh, little scene, and that's really kind of what I m like mostly is like doing a coffee house sort of a sort of a venue. Um, I'm really not interested in staying up till the crack of dawn anymore, and um, um, but I you know I do enjoy playing when I play, and it, 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 invariably when I perform anywhere because I do you know parties with friends and stuff like that. They ask me to bring my guitars over and you know. I, you know, sing at parties and stuff, but I always in, invariably will have a moment where I say, geez, why don't I do this more, you know, because I really enjoy it a lot, and I really feel, you know, hooked in, and it's a real kind of meditative sort of experience. There was a time in my life where, uh, where I felt like I was always up. I mean, I'd only get like three or four hours of sleep a night, and yeah. I mean, where did your red eyes come from? Yeah. You know, yeah. where the experience was. Yeah. Go ahead, man. Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, um, playing in Colorado was uh, uh, was a great experience. It's funny because I, I run into people every once in a while that are from Colorado, and I was oh yeah, I used to live there, and blah blah blah. And I was a band called Night Train, and they go oh yeah, I remember you, and da 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 da. And they said I always remember this tall guy with the big black hat, and that was me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> was it a cowboy hat? Yeah. Uh, it was a it was actually a um, I bought it in a Western wear store, but it was a. Uh, um, a South African hat, you know, a South African kind of mm -hmm. hat, you know. It's really cool. I, I still have it, actually, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I used to play up in the mountains, play ski areas and, and uh, you know, all that sort of thing. And, um, you know, like I said, it would be, you know, you'd be out for three weeks and, you know, play up in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming and, you know, some of these, you know, podunk towns out in Nebraska that nobody's ever heard of. And, Right. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, it was a great experience um, playing with Steve and Kathy Sargenti, who I mentioned before, who Steve is still here on Maui, and, um, you know, you can uh, look for him in the paper, and, you know, he's a great, great talent, you know, great songwriter, great singer, great harmonica player. Right. Um, you know, whereas I uh, stopped and kind of, you know, did other things, he's been doing it the whole time, so he's like, he's like really great. He's been a really good friend. You have, a, yeah. you have me at a disadvantage on the people that you know here because you know almost everybody and I. Yeah. I'm just getting I'm just getting started, Bob. Yeah, right on. Well, Bob, we've got to come to a close. Right on. Thanks. I want to say thank you for uh, Thanks, coming David. on down. Yeah, it was great talking to you. Great talking to you too, Bob. Right on. On to the next part.